الرحيم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت إن شئت تجعل الحزن سهلا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلمه ونستغفرك لما لا نعلمه ثم أما بعد um, Today we will be talking briefly about um, um, Palestine um, from uh, scriptural um, perspective what did the Quran say about Palestine and uh, how various prophets lived in this land and um, Al-Quds in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and just a very brief, very brief history. Um, first of all, um, we know that the first masjid, first place of worship established on earth was Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Al-Kaaba in, in Mecca. And Rasulullah sallallahu was asked what was the next holy mosque established after Kaaba. He said Jerusalem or Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, the word Aqsa means the further because from Mecca, Medina, it's far away. So it's called the further mosque. Um, um, how long between is the establishment of Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Masjid Al-Aqsa? The Prophet said 40 years. So Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and then al masjid al-Nabawi, these three holy mosques in Islam. The difference between these mosques and any other mosque is that a mosque becomes a holy place after it's built. So this area here, and you know, one, one of the founders here, that this was like a farm, right? Farmland, right? It's not holy at all, just regular land. And then when the masjid is established, then it becomes a masjid, becomes a holy place for us. Um, but al-Masjid al-Haram, al-Masjid al-Aqsa was holy even before the building of a big mosque around. The spot, the area itself was made holy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, it was narrated that Al-Kaaba was built by the angels. The first building of Al-Kaaba was made by the angels and then it was destroyed and then Ibrahim alayhi salam rebuilt it. So the foundation was already there. Ibrahim al min al -bayt. So Qawaid, the pillars of or the, the foundation of Al-Kaaba was there. Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, built it. Masjid Al-Aqsa was also a holy place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it holy. Um, and when we read Surah At-Teen, wa teen wa zaytun wa turi sinin. What is a teen? What is zaytun? Teen is the fig. Zaytun is the olive. But why would Allah made an oath by the, these two uh, fruits, a teen and a zaytun? And some ulama said the literal meaning, it is a teen and a zaytun, the fig and the olive. But they also, other ulama said that it refers to the area where a tea and a zaytun grow. It's well known. Zaytun, when you talk about zaytun, talk about Palestine, right? So I swear by a teen, the place where a teen grows, this is a, 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 an a zaytun. And then Latur is in Tur, Jabal Tur in Sinai, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked to Musa. These are holy places. So teen was zaytun referred to place, not to literally the fig and the olive in itself, but refers to the holy areas or the holy place where these two famous fruits grow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called this area of Al-Quds, Al-Ard Al-Mubaraka, the blessed land. The blessed land. And we know when Ibrahim alayhi salam was saved from the fire in Iraq, he and his family and Lut, his nephew, Prophet Lut alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to leave Iraq and to go where? To Jerusalem. We saved him and Lut and we made them migrate to the blessed land. This blessed land is Palestine. Al-Ard al-Mubaraka. The same surah, Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah says about Sulaiman, وَلِسُلَيْمَانَ الْرِيحَ عَاصِفَةً تَجْرِي بِأَمْرِي إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا So the wind was subjected to Sulaiman. تَجْرِي بِأَمْرِهِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا The wind would come back and forth from the land in which we, uh, 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 which we have blessed. 
So Allah blessed this land. And we can see this blessing despite all these disasters and all these wars and occupations um, by the uh, Romans and before that even the Greek and then the British and then Israelis and the Crusaders. Despite all these calamities and disasters still blessed, still alive and still resisting. When Ibrahim salam and his wife Sarah, they migrated there and then they have their offsprings, uh, Ismail, and then Allah told him to take Ismail and Hajar to Mecca. We know the story, right? Before it became Mecca. Um, and then um, they were given a child. Uh, the angels came to Ibrahim and gave him the good news that your wife Sarah, which is very old at that time, that she will get pregnant and she will have a, a child. His name is Ishaq. And not only that, you will see the children of Ishaq and the son of Ishaq will be named Yaqub. They gave them the good news. Right? And that's why the, the name of uh, the city Al-Khalil. Al-Khalil refers to Ibrahim. Salam. Khalil means the close friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim Al-Khalil, the area, the whole area is called Al-Khalil. The Masjid Al-Ibrahimi, because the grave of Ibrahim salam is there. Um, and then Ishaq and Ya'qub, and then Yusuf, you all know the story of Yusuf taking a slave to Egypt, and then he brought his father Ya'qub and his um, brothers, the uh, Al-Asbat, Al -Asbat, the grandchildren of Ya'qub. And Ya'qub's name is Israel. And Israel means the servant of God in Hebrew. So um, that's why they are named Bani Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Ya'qub, alayhi salam, the father of Yusuf. So Bani Israel um, lived in Jerusalem. And bef before that, uh, sorry, they came to Egypt. Um, Yusuf honored them, his father and his brothers, and they lived honored in Egypt. But after years, then they have been um, enslaved. The Egyptian, for some reason, did not like them. And the pharaohs enslaved them and mistreated them, and they killed their newborn babies every other year. And we know the story. And then Musa salam, was born in these harsh circumstances, and Allah protected him, as we all know. And he was raised in the palace of Fir'aun. And then when he grew up, there was an incident when he saw the oppression that Bani Israel are suffering in Egypt, and he saw an Egyptian guy harassing and torturing an Israeli guy. So he went to push the Egyptian, but the guy fell maybe on his head or something, and he died. And that was an accident. Musa did not intend to kill man, just he wanted to push him and stop him from oppressing the Egyptian. But he died. Um, that was a crime. And then he fled Egypt to um, Palestine, a place called Madian. And uh, then after 10 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to come back to Egypt to see his mother and his family who lived in Egypt. We all know the story of Musa when he was coming back to Egypt. He saw fire and he went to the fire. Then Allah talked to him, right? And told him what? Go to Pharaoh. What was the reason? To go to Pharaoh, to invite him to Islam or to invite the Egyptians to Islam. That was not the main reason. The main reason or the task of Musa is to go back to Egypt, talk to Pharaoh, to allow Bani Israel to leave Egypt. And Arsil Ma'ya Bani Israel. That was the main task of Musa, going to Pharaoh. He had a request, and the request was An Arsil Ma'ya Bani Israel. Let the Israelites leave Egypt. They've lived there for so long as free people, and then they've been um, uh, used as slaves. And now it's time to put an end to this misery to free Bani Israel from enslavement in Egypt. Don't torture Bani Israel. Let them come with me. If they, are, they are a problem to you. Let them come freely out of Egypt. Right? But Pharaoh, of course, did not like that. Why? Because they're free labor slaves. Right? And because of his arrogance. No. Who are you to tell me what to do? I'm Pharaoh. He claimed to be God himself. Right? So Musa alayhi salam's task was to... Um, Prove that he's a messenger of Allah, invited them to believe in one God, and he wanted Pharaoh to allow Bani Israel 
to leave Egypt. And Pharaoh refused to do that. And he threatened Musa السلام, to imprison him. And then Musa showed him the ayat, the signs of his prophethood, the, the staff and the turn into a snake and the blood and the frogs and all these kind of and, and flood and, and so on. So they, they did not believe they were too arrogant. And then Allah revealed to Musa to secretly prepare Bani Israel and in the night secretly just leave, sneak out of Egypt. Because Pharaoh will not allow them. So he told Bani Israel, this is what we need to do on this night. Get prepared. We are leaving Egypt. And the night came and the, Egypt, the Israelis were uh, preparing and they're taking as much luggage as they can carry. And, and their uh, wives and children and some animals. So they left secretly in the evening um, out of Egypt until re they reached the Red Sea. And we all know the story. Pharaoh in the morning got the news. That Israelis are fled Egypt. And he himself, he did not order like his generals to go and catch, capture them, bring them back. He himself, he led his army. And they ran after them. And the morning, the Israelis found themselves in front of the sea. And they saw Frown and his hosts coming behind them. Um, then uh, we all know the story. The Israelis said, Musa, what did you do to us? <laughs> At least in Egypt, we were slaves, but we were, um, uh, we're alive. And now we'll be slaughtered. He said, no, Allah will provide an exit for us. So Allah told him to stick. To, to hit the sea with his uh, staff. And then we all know the story. The sea opened up and they were able to pass. And on the other side, Musa tried to bring the water back so that Pharaoh could not cross. And Allah told him, leave it, leave it the way it is. The, it not open up because of you. It is, when I tell you to hit the, the sea, you do that. So it's not up to you. So the goal of Musa was to separate Pharaoh from Bani Israel. Just safety of Israel. But Allah's plan was not only that, it was also allow them to see with their own eyes the destruction of Pharaoh and his hosts. So Pharaoh with his arrogance, he said, well, this is miraculous, but if it happened to these animals, as they call them now, we can cross as well. So he went and then we know the story, he was drowned, he and all his hosts, and the Israelis were watching this with their own eyes. And then in Sinai, they the, the goal was not to stay in Sinai. The walls to, to get some rest in Sinai and then to go to the promised land. It was a promised land. Ya qawm al-ard al-muqaddasa allati katab Allahu lakum. So in Sinai, we all know the stories that they had no water. So Allah told Musa to hit this rock and 12 springs uh, start gushing out of this rock. And each tribe of the 12 Israeli tribes had its own spring, so they don't even have to fight over water. And the man and Selwa came to them every morning. They find um, this food, um, nutritious um, food coming for free. And then uh, they saw some tribes in Sinai. They have their own gods. I said, Musa, it's a good idea to have a god. So why don't you make a god for us like these people have gods? And Musa said, wow, how ignorant are you? You are asking me to create a God for you besides Allah, the one who saved you from Pharaoh. You are so ignorant. And then um, Allah revealed to Musa to come on the top of the mountain to receive the Torah. So he told his brother Harun, you um, uh, lead Bani Israel during my absence and I will talk to Allah and Allah will give me the Torah, which was a, a huge event in the life of the Israelis, that you finally will have the book, the guidance, the light. We all know the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, ordered Musa to come and he came 10 days earlier and he was fasting and engaging in prayer and adhkar and fast. And when Allah told him, why did you come early? He said, yeah, Allah, I came earlier. That's just so my interest and longing to meet you or to talk to you. Um, and I'm fasting. I want to please you. I, that's why I came even earlier. During his absence for 40 days, the Israelis actually went back to this idea of idolatry and they decided that Musa is gone 
would never come back. All right. Um, and they collected whatever jewelry they had and they borrowed from the Egyptians. And they uh, gave it to someone with the name of Samiri, and he melted all this gold and silver, and he made a calf, um, a baby cow, and they uh, worshipped this cow. This is your Lord. This is your Allah. This is your Ilah. Uh, these are the people who are the children of Israel, the children of the, the in, inherited the prophethood, and they know the one God, and, and now they are idol worshippers. That's a, the greatest sin anybody can commit. So... According to the biblical narrative, Aaron or Harun was part of it. But Al Quran says no. Harun tried his best to stop them, but they were about to kill him. So, on the other side, Allah revealed the Torah, the tablets to Musa alayhi salam. And on his way back to his people, Allah revealed to him, Do you know what happened to your people? And Allah revealed to him what, what they have done. And Musa could not believe. He could not believe. That Allah saved them. Allah opened up the sea for them. Allah brought water out of the rock for them. And he bring food for them free for free every day. And now they're worshipping a calf that they made. And when he came and he saw this with his own eyes, he threw the alwah. Al -al Imagine someone, someone gets so angry to the point where he holds the Quran or the Mus'haf and he throws the Mus'haf on the floor. How, how would you see this? If someone was holding the Quran and they throw the Quran away, when people get angry, they throw things, right? This is what usually happens. Just they try to throw things. And this exactly that he reached the point of anger that he did not realize that he's holding the holy Torah. And Alqa al alwah it was broke. And when his brother and he held him from his beard and his, his clothes and he was shake, shaking him. And, why didn't you stop them? Why did you follow my commands? And Harun said, Yabna Ummi, oh, son of my mother, be easy on me. I tried my very best, but they were about to kill me. Then, when anger went away, Musa collected this alwah, these tablets. So that was a big sin. And they paid. They've been punished for this. And then it was time for them to go to the promised land. I just have to know that not all of Bani Israel were worshipping the calf. Like many, the majority of them. But some were good believers. They followed Harun and did not get involved in this. Um, so now the plan was to take them out of Egypt to Jerusalem. That was the, the goal, to reach Jerusalem, to establish religion there and, and to follow the Torah and so on. Now, the only thing that stands between them and doing that is the resident of Jerusalem at that time, which were the giants or polytheists. The giants were like very tough and big and huge and strong. Alhamdulillah. And it was time for them now to go and fight, to enter Jerusalem. Surah Al-Ma'idah talked about this. Ya ard al Enter the Holy Land, which Allah has promised you. There are so powerful people live there. Until they leave it, we cannot enter it. Of course, the giants are not going to leave, leave their, their homeland. So jihad or fighting was the only way. Don't talk about jihad and fighting. It's not like purely Islamic stories of many prophets. They have to fight. And are held heroes because they have to fight for a good reason. So they said, we cannot fight these giants. If they left voluntarily, then we will enter it. But we cannot fight these people. They like the easy life in Sinai. Free, fresh water. No water bills. And free food. Man and Salwa. And are safe in Sinai. They like this kind of easy life. And they did not want to fight the giants to enter Jerusalem. 
and then he and Musa and Harun told him, "Itkhulu alayhim al-bab." Faida dakhaltumu. We promise. Allah promised you. Just enter the door. Just start. When you enter, you will be victorious. Allah promised you. Allah will give you victory. What else do you need? Allah promises you. You will win the war. You will enter Jerusalem. قالوا يا موسى إن لن ندخلها أبدا ما دام فيها. We will never ever think of entering this city, the Holy Land, the Promised Land, until they leave. So you and your Lord go and fight them. Why don't you, Musa, and your Lord, فذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا إن ها هنا قابل. We are staying here. And just by contrast, in the Battle of Badr, time for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he said to the companion, what, what, should, what should we do? We are only 313 and the people of Mecca were 1,000. What should we do? And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah said, Ya Rasulullah, we are not going to tell you what Bani Israel said to Musa. You go and your Lord and fight them. We are staying here. But we'll say, go with your Lord, fight them. We will fight with you. That's, that's a big difference. So Bani Israel refused to fight the giants. And Musa made a dua, said, Ya Rabbi, inni la amliku illa nafsi I, can, I have no control or no authority over anyone except myself and my brother. I, I cannot force them to fight. Tafruq baynana wa bayna al-qawm al Musa was longing to go and to achieve the dream. And the dream was to enter Jerusalem, to build a temple or mosque or a place of worship, to establish the Torah and to, for this people of of the Torah to flourish and to grow in Jerusalem. The land to which Ibrahim السلام, migrated and Sarah and Ishaq and Yaqub, all these people grew up there. That was the dream. But Musa السلام, died before seeing this dream coming true. And Rasulullah وسلم, said, Wallahi, I know where his grave is. Nobody knows where Musa is buried. Nobody can claim that we know the grave of Except Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He, Allah told him about the grave where Musa is buried. In the Al-Kathib Al-Ahmar, he said, at the Red Hills. It's, he was praying to Allah to make him die as close as possible from Jerusalem. To be buried as close as possible. So he's, as they said, Rami at Hajar, the distance of throwing a stone. If you throw a stone from Jerusalem, this is where the grave of Musa is. Not far from Jerusalem. But he could not enter Jerusalem and live and see Bani Israel, you know, um, established there. And as a result, for 40 years, they were wandering in the desert of Sinai, uh, divided among themselves, until 40 years, a new generation came under the leadership of Yusha bin Nun. And uh, the one whose story was mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, when Musa went to learn from the other guy and he took his helper with him that was Yusha bin Nun so Yusha bin Nun was the leader of Bani Israel because every prophet dies and then Allah when, when a prophet dies then Allah sent another prophet there are so many prophets came to Bani Israel they needed so many prophets so he actually raised a younger generation and they went and they decided to go and fight the giants to enter Jerusalem because it was promised this is a holy land and the polytheists cannot be in a holy land and then Bani Israel, then they asked their prophet Samuel to um, assign a king for them. said, all communities, they have a king. We are 12 tribes, but we don't have a king. So Saul prayed to Allah, Ya Allah, uh, Samuel prayed to Allah to appoint a king, because it's very difficult to elect a king among Bani Israel, 12 tribes, and each tribe feel like we are more superior to other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed Talut. قَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَثَ لَكُمْ طَالُوتَ مَلِكَ And Talut was not like one who was coming from one of the elite families. He was a regular man, but he was tall, strong, and knowledgeable, have charismatic leadership. And his name is Saul. So Saul is your... And this, how... How could it be that Saul is a, a regular person? We have more right of kingdom and leadership than him. He does not even have enough money. 
He said, Allah, you asked for a king, and Allah chose him. Allah, Allah chose him. He has more knowledge and more physical power. He's, he's the leader. And there's a sign, by the way, that the sign is that you will be able to uh, regain that tabut. Tabut al um, um is, is like, like a box that in which the stake of Musa and some other remainings of Musa and Harun. And this for them was, was the holiest thing. Um, uh, that was lost when they when 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 they lost their battles. Then he said that the tabut will come back to you. So it's a sign that Saul is your king. So Saul actually led them. One of his soldiers, a person with the name David or Dawood, was 17 years old, brave, strong, and Galat was the leader of the giants. And as you have seen, perhaps the movie. Um, uh, Galat is a big and tall and muscular. And nobody would dare to fight him. But David said, "I will, I will fight him." And he um, it, it was man managed to kill Galat. And they entered Al Ard Al Muqaddasa, and David became the king of Israel. Well, for the Israelis, being uh, kingdom is more holy than the prophets. So, so King David, King David, because that's a golden age now for the Jews. Now they. Not only they left Egypt, they got their freedom, but they also killed the um, Galat and the giants and were victorious and they entered Jerusalem. And Dawood was a prophet and king. From our perspective, he was a prophet and a king, not just a king. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised uh, Dawood. And he told him, We made you Khalifa. We gave you authority on earth. Judge between people with the truth. Right? Um, and David had plenty of children. One of them was Solomon. Suleiman. <clears throat> Suleiman was also given wisdom, knowledge, power, intelligence. Right? So, وَوَارِفَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood. So Suleiman inherited the prophethood and the kingdom. He became the king after the death of his father, Dawood. Dawood, of course, tried to build a place of worship, and Suleiman completed this uh, place, which uh, to us is a place of worshiping Allah alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's unique about Dawood and Suleiman is that <clears throat> they represent the coexistence between power and justice. Because usually there's when there's one, the other does not exist. Powerful people do not like justice because justice makes them equal to others. That's the norm in all uh, uh, civilizations that how to be so powerful and to be just and fair. Very few people were able to achieve this balance. So Dawood and Suleiman were kind of these people who are super powerful, especially Suleiman. Allah gave him subjected for him the jinn and the wind and and he was able to understand the language of animals and birds and insects he was giving this kind of amazing power that no one that we know of had this kind of power but they were so powerful but at the same time they were so just and fair they did not use this power to abuse others but to establish justice do not follow your desire judge you know, between people with justice. So Suleiman came, um, and there are so many things to be said about Suleiman, uh, maybe in different time. But when Suleiman died, um, his his kingdom was divided into the north and the south. Um, and there was all some conflict among Bani Israel, and they gradually start going far away from the teaching of the Torah, changing the words of Allah, deleting some verses, adding something into the Torah. That's why when Jesus came, he was so angry at them. You know what Jesus called them? The Pharisees. He said, you're hypocrites. These corrupt rabbis who turned the Torah into something that served their own interest. That for your sins to be forgiven, you have to pay this amount of gold. Right? Um, and, and, and so on. So, so made, big, made big fuss about little things and let go of, of big crimes because people, wealthy people can pay for forgiveness and so on. Um, they changed the temple of 
Allah into a place of where they exchange currency. Because people who come for Hajj at that time from Egypt, they bring Egyptian currency, they have to change it to um, local um, uh, currency. It's the same thing for those who come from Iraq and Syria. So it was a place of business, basically. So there's huge corruption to the point where Allah needed to send Isa السلام, to bring them back to the teaching of Musa. That's why Isa came. And he said that I did not come to um, contradict the word of God. I came to affirm it. Because you went so far away from it, became so materialistic. So he came to challenge the authority of these rabbis and to bring him back to the Torah. And he was given the gospel, which was focusing mainly on spirituality. No, no more, more rules, because the rules were there. The law was already in the Torah. So in Christianity, they don't focus so much on laws. It's a focus on spirituality and belief and so on. We Muslims, we believe all these messages came with the same uh, message, the essence. Um, and then um, Isa alayhi salam told them that you have corrupted the religion. And um, they were so envious of him. They did not recognize him as the Messiah. And they actually um, tried to capture and kill him. And they told the Romans, his blood is on us and our children. This man is causing so much corruption, Jesus. And uh, people will revolt against you. You will lose your kingdom. Um, and his troublemaker, just, just kill him. Um, and, and they tried actually to put Jesus in a, in, a, in a hot spot. As they say, that one day he was giving a speech. And someone told him that, uh, should we pay the taxes to the Romans? Because we are supposed to give charity in the Torah. We should give certain portion of our wealth as charity. So, and now the emperor or, or Caesar is asking us to pay taxes. Should we? Because if we paid him taxes, then we are violating the Torah. If we don't, then we'll be politically in trouble, right? They try to trap Jesus. And his answer, the very famous line, uh, many secular um, like to use this line, that give uh, a render um, uh, to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. The separation of church and state. But that was the political, economical situation then. If you don't pay taxes, you'll be in trouble. Right? So give Caesar the taxes that is required and give God the zakat or charity. That, that's what we do, by the way, Muslims, American Muslims here. It's not just one thing or the other. We have to pay taxes and we have to pay zakat. That's two separate things. So this beautiful and, and accurate and wise answer of Jesus was and actually he came out of this situation because they wanted to trap him to say because they expected them him to say okay no you do what the Torah says forget about Caesar you listen to God God is the only authority Caesar has no authority they expected him to have such answer and in this case he would be in big trouble with the Romans so the Romans can kill him and arrest him get rid of him they would want to get rid of him right and um Eventually, they convinced the Romans to capture and kill Jesus. And we know the story that Allah protected Isa alayhi salam. He was with his disciples in the last supper. And then he said, who would take my shape and will be my neighbor in Jannah? And one, the youngest one of the disciples said, I'll do that. And he repeated the question again. And the same person gave the same answer three times. And he took the shape of Jesus. And Allah protected Jesus and raised him up to him. And they captured this person and they thought they captured and crucified Jesus. But Allah said, Because crucifixion at that time, by the way, was linked to a curse. So if you are crucified, regardless whether you're innocent or not, if you are crucified, which is a very terrible thing, then this means that you are cursed. So Allah protected Isa from this humiliation, from this torture, and from the concept of being cursed. He is a prophet of Allah, chosen one. So Allah saved him. And we all know that the whole Christian theology is based on this concept of the crucifixion of Jesus as redemption for the sins committed by all people and so on. Want something? Please. Okay. All right. Um, then Jesus, before this um, incident, he warned them that this building will not... Uh, you will not find one stone on the top of the other. 
not one, st one stone will remain on the top of the other. In other words, it will be totally destroyed because of your sins. It's exactly what happened in year 130. The Romans came and uh, the Byzantines came in and they destroyed the temple and they, the Jews actually were scattered everywhere in the world. And they know, they know, they say it. The Torah said, because of your sins, because of your disobedience, changing the words of Allah, denying the ayat of Allah, rejecting Jesus, because of all these sins, you are punished. You're going to live everywhere in the world. After having place promised by Allah, is it? Promise, yes, it was a promised land, but that's not unconditional. This is, I want to emphasize this important point. Because the Jews always say that we are the children of God, we are the beloved of God, we are the people of God. The answer is yes and no. It is yes if you follow the commands of God. He chose you, he sent you one of his best prophets, he revealed the Torah for you. You were the only one who were worshiping one God at that time. So therefore you were chosen one, you are Children of God mean that the righteous people, the closest people to God, you were. But this does not mean that it's, it's in your DNA, it's in your race. Because you are among the children of Israel, or automatically, no matter what you do, is you are chosen. No. Similar to our case as Muslims. It's not just because you read Quran and you follow Muhammad, you are, you are automatically the best. No. In fact, if you claim you are one of the followers of Muhammad, you read the Quran, but you violate what the Quran says. Live your life according to your whims and desires, not according to the Sunnah of Muhammad. Then you have nothing to do with Muhammad. You are the best when you follow the guidance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Not when you violate the rule, the laws of God, and kill prophets, and deny the signs of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, cause corruption, and you still are. We are the children of God. It doesn't work like this with Allah. Allah does not prefer or made supreme one race over another race. This racism does not take place with Allah. Yeah, Allah chosen you and give you the Torah, but if you violate it, you, you will be the worst, not the best. He promised you this land for a purpose, not because you are supreme or superior, superior to others. When you violate the law of Allah, then you don't deserve this honor. And because of their sins, and many Jews who reject Israel and the anti-Israelis, many Jews in America here, I don't know the name of the, the, the group, that they say that coming back or be, having the Jews in one state violates the will of God. Because it's God's will to, um, for us to live in different places, not to have one place until the Messiah comes. We are paying the price for our sins. They, they said, this is written in their book. Because Allah cursed us because of our sins. Right? So, so they were scattered everywhere in the world. And then, before we get into this, um, after Isa, alayhi salam, this place was, uh, the Jerusalem and the temple was, totally destroyed, and uh, the city was burned, Jews were kicked out. That was 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago. And they said, oh, we are not occupying Palestine, we are the native people. We lived there 2,000 years ago. In the time of Muhammad, alayhi salam, 600 years after Isa, there was no masjid, there was no building. Yet, Al-Qur'an named it Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylan min al-Masjid Al-Haram ila al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. There is no masjid. But the place itself is masjid. Regardless whether there's a building or not. You, you see the point? So, everything in, included in the um, ancient Jerusalem inside the, the, the fence, the ancient fence. That's called Al-Quds Al-Atiq. Right? The ancient Jerusalem. This is a masjid, regardless with the w w w w if, if the golden dome is there or not, or the masjid, God forbid, was destroyed. The area itself is called masjid. So when Rasulullah went there, there was no building. 
But Allah called it, because the word masjid in Arabic coming from sujood, sajada to prostrate. And the place in which you make sujood is called masjid. The place of sujood, yani. Maf'il, anything, um, you put it in maf'il, it becomes the place in which the verb is practiced. So sajada, yasjud, sujood, masjid. The masjid is the place in which the worshippers prostrate themselves to Allah. So Allah named it Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So when he went there and he met all the prophets and he led prayer there, there was no such a building with windows and walls and things. Was, but the area, as we mentioned earlier, was a holy place, blessed place. So Muhammad وسلم, went there. It was not like far away from the thinking of Muhammad. At that time, for political and um, circumstances, Rasulullah could not go to free Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and build a good masjid there. He could not do that because he was so busy with Quraysh and Ghatafan and, and Khaybar and all these wars and migration from Mecca to Medina and all these things. So two things happened in the life of the Prophet that shows how important this place is. It's a land of the Prophets. Rasulullah went there, as we mentioned, in the night journey and then the ascension to the seven heaven. And when he came back and he told the people of Quraysh about his journey, they said, oh, it doesn't make sense. How could you go and come back in the same night? It takes weeks to go to Jerusalem and weeks to come back. You went there and came back at the same night. You are lying. He said, no, I'm not lying. I'm telling, I'm telling you the truth. So, okay, describe, because they used to go for business trips. Describe Ilya, they called Ilya, that's the name uh, of, of Jerusalem, or Quds, or uh, Quds. So he described them perfectly, what he saw there. And he said, on my way back, by the way, I saw this uh, caravan, and these people were staying in this place because a cam the camel actually ran away, and they were all searching for this camel. I saw them on my way. So a few days later, these people came, arrived to Mecca, and said, is it yet in this night, in this place, we lost the camel and we're for it. So Rasulullah was able to describe the place, right, uh, that called Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Al-Ladhi Barakna Hawla. Then towards the end of the life of the Prophet, when Khalas, Mecca is no longer an enemy, Quraysh, is not an, uh, and Mecca became a Muslim city, and done with Khaybar, and he was done with biggest enemies, then the biggest enemy became the Romans or the Byzantines, the Roman Empire. Now they thought that Muhammad and Islam is growing, and even their allies of Arabs became Muslims, and they are losing ground. So they decided to come down to invade Arabia. And Rasulullah heard about this, and he prepared an army under the leadership of Usama ibn Zaid, who was only 17 years old at that time. And some Muslims said, why, why this young man becomes leader on us? He, we have children older than him. And Rasulullah got mad. He was actually in the last days of his life. He was sick, despite his illness. And he said that, I heard some of you opposing the leadership of Usama. And you oppose the leadership of his father, Zaid. And wallahi, he is qualified. And I insist that Usama is the leader. And the army of Usama was supposed to go to this area to push back the Romans and eventually to enter Jerusalem and to establish the masjid. When Usama, as the, 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 the borders of Medina, he heard that the Prophet Sallallahu is so sick. So he left the army, came back to Medina, and he went and he kissed the forehead of the Prophet. And the Prophet was looking at the heaven and then looking at Usama. And he said, I knew that he's praying for me. So next day, the Prophet gained some energy and he told him, just go in the morning. Take your, your army and go. He went in the same day the Prophet ﷺ passed away. So the idea of, of regaining or, or, or building a mosque there or, or reestablishing the holy uh, place of worship in Jerusalem was not far from the mind of the Prophet ﷺ. And then Muslims, after they did this in the time of Omar, when the two superpowers were fighting each other for 700 years, the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire, Right, a room, and then when Muslims were able in a few years to um, defeat these two superpowers and they gained 
tower over Jerusalem. And at that time, I forgot to mention that, that, that the Romans became 300 years after the destruction of the temple, they became Christians. Constantine, 300 years, he, he adopted Christianity because Christianity was working, everybody likes it. And politicians like to own anything people like, right? Whether it's religion or scholars or anything people like, they want to own it. So they said, okay, it's very popular. People like it. So, okay, we are the official church. He became, and he's the one, by the way, who introduced the concept of Trinity 300 years after Isa. There was no such idea of three in one. Anyways, um, so Muslims have to fight the Romans and they push them out of Jerusalem. And it was time for the priests to give the keys of Jerusalem to Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, who was the leader of, of Muslims at that, at that time. But he said, no, I would rather give the key to the Khalifa himself, the Caliph, Omar. We heard about his justice and fairness, so I would give the keys of Jerusalem to Omar himself. So Abu Ubaidah sent to Omar. Medina said, oh, these uh, priests, they ask you yourself to come to receive the keys. He said that, I will come. So Omar came from Medina with one person. You can imagine that he would go in a caravan as a triumphant, victorious leader to open Jerusalem to receive. No, he went with one of his servants, one camel. So Omar would ride for some time, and then the servant would ride for some time, and then they both walk and give some free time to the camel. So they alternate. And as you can imagine, traveling from Medina to Jerusalem with a camel, one camel, two people, it's, it's not an easy task. But Omar did that. At the time when everybody, all the leaders of the community waiting for Amir Mu'minin Omar to come, Right? It was the turn of the servant to ride and for Omar to lead the camel, walking. And not only that, they were walking in a swamp. And Omar had to pull his old clothes anyways and walk in this swamp. And people saw this. Oh, he's Amir Munin. Where, where is Amir this, this guy Amir Munin? This is Omar? He said, yes. Could not believe it. Abu Ubaidah, just to give you an idea about how righteous this Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah was, how much Omar loves him. He, Omar said, if Abu Ubaidah was alive, I would have pointed him as the Khalifa. This is how righteous this man was. So Abu Ubaidah, when Omar came in such shape with his clock patch, with his feet dirty, and his servant riding the camel, and his so Abu Abayda said, um, I wish you just change your clothes and just look like that. Omar made such a wonderful, strong statement when he said, if someone else told me that, I would punish him. I cannot do this to you, Abu Bakr, because I love you so much, because your contribution. But if someone else other than you told me this, I would have punished him. We were the most humiliated people on earth. And Allah gave us dignity by giving us Islam. And if we try to seek dignity anywhere else, we'll be humiliated again. It's not our clothes. It's not our ride. It's not our shape that gives us dignity it is islam that gives us dignity and he entered and he received the keys and said which where should i pray one of the jews who convert to islam his name is kabul ahbar said to him you 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 pray here in this church he said no i'm not gonna pray in the church why because he said if i pray to this church muslims after me with all oh, omar prayed here they're gonna turn it into a mosque i don't want this to happen keep it at church And he went to where the Masjid al-Aqsa now, and he prayed there. And later on, Muslims built the, 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 the Golden Dawn. And um, Muslims, Jews, and Christians were allowed to worship freely. Muslims never 
forced anyone to convert to Islam or to destroy any temple or any church. In fact, Muslims, according to Islamic law, they have the responsibility to protect Jewish and Christian minorities, guarantee that they have freedom of religion, celebrate their holidays, build their church. Muslims were ready to sacrifice their lives protecting the religious minorities. That's what Islam is. That's what Islamic law says. You have to protect religious minorities, especially Jews and Christians. And from that time, until the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, Jerusalem was occupied by crusaders for 90 years. And the crusaders came from Europe in the name of the cross, in the name of Jesus. They massacred in one day 80,000 Palestinians. They were killing anybody in their face. And people ran to the mosque thinking that the mosque has like holy... They could not imagine. But they entered the mosque with their horses. And they killed 80,000 people. And they wrote to their kings in Europe that the blood of the Palestinians reached the knees of our horses. And this act was blessed by the Pope and the Christian leaders in Europe. 90 years. Now Palestine is occupied for how long? 75 years? And nobody could imagine, could have imagined that the, the crusaders will leave, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Salah al-Din and other ulama, and they were able to free Palestine from the 90 years of occupation. And after that, until 1948, the gangs of Zionists came to occupy Palestine again, and this occupation will come to an end. I have no doubt of this. I'll stop here. If you have any comment or question before we end. Thank you so much. Thank you for your talk. I think it was very educational and insightful. I do have a couple questions, if you could clarify for me, please. Uh, oh, and then you were talking uh, earlier about Musa Sudan when he was traveling, and you said this name from Al Qahab. I know it is Al Khidr, I think. Al Khidr was a teacher, but but the, the serve the 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 helper is Qada Musa Ali Fatahu. Fatahu, his Fata, the helper, the assistant. Uh, that was Yusha bin Nuh. But the teacher was Al Khidr. Yusha. 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 Yeah. 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 So that was his name. <clears throat> yeah. You, Yusha Ibn Noon. I don't know what's the name in English, but Yusha mm -hmm. is the known. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. about what is going on now, we know for 75 years under the Zionist occupation of what used to be the free lands controlled by the former Ottoman Empire under the Muslims. So my question is, what do we know going forward about this land? Do we have any insight whether it will remain occupied? What is known to us as Muslims? Um, you need to come next Sunday to get the answer to this question, right? Because it takes so long to answer such <laughs> questions. But I would refer you, uh, this is what I'm planning to do, inshallah. Um, there are two books written by the same Israeli historian. His name is Eli Pepe. Remember this name, Eli Pepe. He was born in Haifa, all right? He grew up there. He was in, in the Israeli army during 1973 war in, at Golan uh, Heights. As Israeli as anybody can be, all right? Then he studied history. And he found out that there's something wrong. That they told him two contradictory things. They said that our Palestinians lived voluntarily because Arab leaders told them to leave Palestine. So we're going to kill the Jews and then you come back. So they lived freely. Another narrative, they told them that Israel, uh, Palestine was a land without the people. So he told his teacher, how could it be a land without people? And you told us that Palestinians lived voluntarily. It doesn't make sense. And then he became a PhD student. He went to Oxford University. 
And he studied 1948, after 30 years of unclassifying the British documents about um, Israel and Palestine. So that was 30 years that he started his PhD in 1980, two years after removing the classification on the documents. And he studied them, and he wrote a number of books, but I would refer you to two books I highly recommend. I went to Amazon to buy the book, but the book was sold out, and they promised that they would put it back in the market because it's how many people want to buy the same book. The name of the book is The, Palest uh, uh, um, the Ethnic Lensing of Palestine. Easy and simple. The Ethnic Lensing of Palestine. Elan Pepe. And you can YouTube him giving lectures about it. And he actually, he's a, he's, he's a historian. And he discussed the archive in England and in Israel. And he put it together and he reached a conclusion about how many people lived there and how many villages and their places and how many massacres that Israeli have, have, have committed to expel people out. All And he wrote another book for, your, for those of you who want The Ten Myths About Israel. The Ten Myths About Israel. They hate him. They call him and historian like him, like new historian. Because they found it's very academic, scientific. He wrote about the expulsion of Palestinians and burning cities and committing massacres in, in South Lebanon and, and everywhere in, in, in Israel, in, in, in Palestine. And he wrote about these myths that there was a land without a people. It's nonsense. Yeah, they changed the word of Allah. Allah said, you have al kalim, Torah. They changed the Torah. Don't you think they would change the, the narrative history? They do all the time. How could you sell such a silly argument that that was a, a land without a people? We're talking now like, about like thousands of years from time Ibrahim, alayhi salam. You are telling me this is a land without a people? So what they try to do is that any settler colonizing power, what they do, they don't want to be a minority. They pushed Palestinians into two places, a place called Gaza, which actually most of the people of Gaza are refugees from other cities and, and villages, and some ghetto pockets in East, uh, the, 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 the West Bank to guarantee that Arabs and Palestinians are not the majority and how to do to change the demography, bring as many Jews as possible and kick out as many Palestinians as possible. This is what systematically been doing since 1948. Every single day. Every single day. Bungarian and other airports receive Polish, Russian, Ethiopian, American, Jews and Palestinians have no right to come back. This is how we change demography. And they call it the best democracy in the Middle East. I don't know what kind of democracy they're talking about. Last question before Salah, Salah time. Yes. You, you mentioned about the substitution of Jesus. <laughs> is, that, is, that a, is that a Quran or is that a Hadith? Quran, say, should be Halahum. About a specific instance where he asked some people right. to take his place. Yes, that that's the explanation of Shubbi Halam because the Quran says something briefly and the, the hadith of the Prophet come to give more details to it. So the ayah mentioned it briefly and the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, came to explain this brief story in more details. But regardless, even if it, forget about the hadith, what we know for sure. That they did not capture him, did not kill him, did not crucify him. That's what Quran clearly said. They thought they did this to Jesus, but they did it to someone else. So there's this no is there's no reference to Christianity there, is there? No. Subhanakallahumma bihamdi kanashdu alla ilahi lant mustafur kanatu ulaik wa asri in the insan alafi khusf illa vina amu amu salihat. تواصل بالحق تواصل بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون السلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين